I'm delighted to be with you today. As Claire was saying, maybe we didn't have much choice in the matter at all. Maybe it was all predetermined. Uh, for the next 45 minutes, we're going to be exploring how the revolution in technology is allowing us to now really dissect our behavior and really start to unpick the very nuts and bolts, the very mechanisms by which our behaviors, even our very complex cognitive capacities, can arise. And as we start to understand more about how our brains operate, we're starting to have to really grapple with the question, maybe our idea of free will, maybe our idea of agency, the idea that we are free to make the choices that we want to in, the li in our lives, from the everyday decisions to what we choose to eat, for example, to who we choose to um, be friends with, who we form our tribes with, even to who we want to have as our lifelong partner, um, or even some of the much higher cognitive skills, so for example, how our perception of the world is built, our sense of reality, even our belief about the world, how they are formed. As we're starting to understand more and more about the nuts and the bolts of how the brain uh, is, is set up, how it's organized and how it operates, a lot of that information is giving us a huge amount of understanding about how these behaviors are very much pre-wired and preordained into the physical structure of our brain. And this is something that we're going to be exploring over the next 40 minutes. Um, but in order to kickstart that process, I'm going to ask you to try and make sense of this. So have a listen to this sentence. I'm getting quite a lot of uh, blank looks, I'll be honest, from the audience. Did anybody really understand that to any great degree? So a few hands are up, but to most of you, probably that was complete gobbledygook, right? Yep. Uh, don't worry, that's fine. It is meant to be gobbledygook. It is, in fact, gobbledygook. I'm not quite sure what you were hearing, uh, but <laughs> you must have a wonderful brain. Now, listen to this second sentence. You should be able to understand this. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage. Poor camel, okay, it's not a very nice sentence. Uh, I'm feeling a huge amount of empathy uh, to the camel. Maybe that was predetermined, I don't know. Um, now we're going to revert back to the original audio file. See if you can make sense of this now. Suddenly, your brain is overlaying that prior information, that knowledge of the, the, the camel was being kept in the cage at the zoo. And because it's got the similar scent, the, a similar cadence to the gobbledygook sentence, your brain is overlaying that information and interpreting the gobbledygook as sense. And forevermore now, if you hear that gobbledygook sentence, you will always hear about this poor camel being kept in a cage at the zoo. And this is a really neat example of how our brain does this constantly, all the time. Your brain is being bombarded by information that's coming in through your senses from the world around you, and it tries to make sense of the world all the time to give you snapshots of reality so that you can make your decisions. But a large amount of time, there's a huge number of assumptions and shortcuts that your brain has to take in order to make sense of the world constantly to give you an up-to-date picture of reality. And so it makes assumptions and takes shortcuts based on your prior knowledge and your prior experiences. And we're going to be returning to this point a little bit later because it's really key to trying to understand how parts of our decision making and our choices in life are also pre-wired or predetermined into us. But before we continue with this, I'm sorry, I've got basically one slide of brain theory or brain facts. So just bear with me for this one slide whilst I uh, give you a huge amount of uh, kind of neuroscience nuggets for you. Okay, so your brain weighs about 1.5 kilograms, which isn't a huge amount. It's about 2% of your total body mass. But your brain is a greedy, hungry beast, and it consumes about 20% of your daily energy quota. Why is that? Well, it's because your brain contains about 86 billion nerve cells. 86 billion, that's a huge number, almost too big to comprehend. It's about 14 times the number of people on this planet, which again is too big a number really to grapple with for your mind to understand. So if you imagine 
that I took a little, uh, kind of, I don't know, scalpel and dug into your skull and scooped out a little bit of your brain tissue the size of a sugar grain. Just imagine that I did that. Uh, what you'd find within that sugar grain, if I look down the microscope, is about 10,000 nerve cells. So if you then ex ex extrapolate that little sugar grain into the big volume that is your brain mass and your br brain volume, then you've got 86 billion nerve cells. And each one of these nerve cells looks a little bit like this. They're absolutely beautiful structures. There's like a big globular cell body in the middle, this big kind of, um, or small, uh, kind of circular structure that's got the DNA in it, in the nucleus, which basically acts as the dictator uh, for the nerve cell. And then extending out from the nerve cell is this wonderful axon structure. It's a long structure which is a little bit like a tree trunk, if you like. And then on both ends of that cell, uh, cell body and axon, there's arborizations, branches of the nerve cell, which are called dendrites. And these dendrites are basically, again, I think they look like a beautiful tree canopy with, canopy with um, branches of the tree. And these dendrites allow each one of your nerve cells, each one of your 86 billion nerve cells, to connect to up to 10,000 other nerve cells using these arborizations which means that within your brain, there's actually 100 trillion connections between your brain cells. And why are these connections so important? Well, they allow this um, electrical current, which is basically sent uh, via sodium and I um, potassium ions being zipped in and out of the cell membrane of that axon, that tree trunk-like structure. They basically pump these ions in and out of that kind of bark, if you like, along the long cylindrical structure. That allows the passage of an electrical current, because it's ions, it's charged ions, to zip along that nerve cell. Then when it reaches the end of that nerve cell, it goes on to the next nerve cell that it's connected to, and then again, that electrical current is sent to that next nerve cell, and to the next nerve cell, and to the next nerve cell in the series. Basically, your brain is this incredibly complicated, intricate neural circuit board. And there's this wonderful experiment that we can do to prove the fact that your nerve cell uses the power of electricity in order for you to think. Can anyone uh, conjure up some kind of experiment that we could do to prove this idea, this concept? It's a bit of a mean experiment, I have to say. Any ideas? It involves one of these. And I need a, vo a volunteer or a guinea pig. I can't believe you're actually volunteering for this. <laughs> yes, if you'd like to join me on stage. Thank you. A big warm uh, round of applause for our volunteer here, who's very brave. What's your name? Gabrielle. Gabrielle. Okay, Gabrielle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you this so that you can talk, okay. but also to kind of almost distract you. Um, now, Gabrielle, what I've got here is an electric shock panel, <laughs> uh, which we're going to expose to Gabrielle's most exposed nerve in the nerve cell in the body. I'm not going to expose, uh, kind of apply it to her brain because I haven't uh, done the risk assessment for that. Uh, so what we're going to do is apply it here. You know when you hit your funny bone? Not very funny, is it? It really hurts. Uh, that's because there's this nerve called the ulnar nerve which runs all the way from the shoulder to the hand in order to control movement in the hand. Um, and it, the, the basically nerve signal originates in the motor cortex, which runs like an Alice band across the head here. And there's a region here in Gabrielle's motor cortex where an electric current is initiated, which then sends a signal to her hand all the way down the ulnar nerve, past the funny bone, so that she can move her hand. That's how it normally operates. But what we're going to do instead is apply that electric current to her hand here. Um, <laughs> and. Sorry, Gabrielle, I'm actually going to have to hold that. And if you hold this in place here, so keep it there, yeah? Is that OK? And then... OK, and ready? Five, four, three, two, one, on. I've got quite a small electrical current that's on at the moment. Would you like me to increase the current? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's a maximum current that this allows, this system allows. So there we go. Are you feeling more of a... Yeah. And you can change... Okay, wow, and it's starting to recruit more and more muscles now. 
as we're upping. You can know that's the maximum that it will go to. And I'm going to switch it off. And on. And off. And on. Thank you, Gabrielle. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, <laughs> very brave. So um, that's demonstrating that your nervous system, the nerves in your body, but also the nerves in your brain, use this power of electricity, the pumping of sodium and potassium ions along that long axon uh, tree trunk-like structure in order, and across the neural circuitry, in order for you to uh, think, to process all the information that's coming in through your senses, and also to allow you to move, to direct movement by controlling your muscles so that you can change the world around you based on your thoughts, so that you can pick things up and change things, and also so that you can communicate with other people, using your muscles to communicate your emotions and your thoughts that way. And that, I think, is basically the point to our existence, which is quite nice that neuroscience has answered that in a nice, neat experiment. Talking of which, I need another volunteer for the next experiment, a vol uh, another volunteer. I'm going to pick someone that from the back of the room now. Yeah? If you, yeah? Waving your, yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. So there's no electric shock here. Uh, big round of applause for our second volunteer who's very bravely coming onto the stage. I'm going to ask you to take a seat here. What's your name? Aaron. 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 Nice to meet you, Aaron. Uh, take your seat here. Um, Claire, if I could possibly have a hand with this. Thank you. So Aaron, if you hold this. What I've got here is some electrodes. Uh, that I'm going to apply to Aaron's brain. So, <laughs> to read the electrical oscillations within Aaron's brain as he is on stage in front of us. Uh, oops. Sorry. We've got three electrodes. I don't suppose you could hold some of them in place. I think. And then there's a third electrode here. And we're going to measure the electrical oscillations of Aaron's brain live on stage as he thinks his different thoughts. I can't apply the electric shock to Aaron whilst we're doing this. So I can't control his behavior. Uh, sorry, close file. Save. Yeah. Hey, beautiful. So that's now working. So what we've got here, if we have a look at the screen, is what we've got here, so we should be showing the live feed from the screen, is the raw electrical activity from the brain The raw electrical activity of those 86 billion nerve cells as they move around and as they're pumping the electric, the sodium and potassium ions in and out, uh, speeds of about 120 miles an hour, um, allowing us to process information. Oh, there we go. Process information from the outside world and allowing us to think. So now we've got, what we've got on that green uh, line in the middle is the raw electrical oscillations uh, across Aaron's brain. Now, Aaron, what I'm going to ask you to do is close your eyes and now wiggle your eyebrows furiously. So there's a little bit of a delay, but you can see that we're picking up a change in electrical activity. And now if you st stop and rest and stay as still as possible, we should see it go back to normal. So that green bar in the middle is the raw electrical activity of Aaron's brain. The blue, just above that, is the alpha waves. So alpha waves are a slower um, frequency of electrical oscillations that are involved in calm and possibly creative uh, thoughts. 
Above that are gamma waves. Gamma waves are really fast oscillatory electrical activities that help to synchronize uh, electrical circuits across the whole of the brain. Because they're almost like, if you imagine your brain like an orchestra, um, the, the gamma waves are like a flute which dance over the melody and allow different bits of the brain's circuitry to be recruited so that you can use the whole of your connectome, those 100 trillions of connections, in order to piece together your thoughts of the world. Now, interesting Buddhist monks seem to have incredibly high gamma waves, possibly through the act of meditation, which, in, which is thought to enhance their gamma waves. So down here, we've also got delta and theta waves in the pink and the purple. We're not seeing a huge amount of delta and theta waves with Aaron at the moment, which I'm really pleased to say that's a good thing, Aaron. Uh, basically, if they were high, uh, they're the slower frequency um, brain waves. That's more associated with being asleep. So I'm glad that Aaron isn't asleep at the moment. Uh, and then we've got beta waves right at the bottom of the green there. That's associated with more focused, uh, concentrated thought, which we've got quite a lot of activity there for Aaron. So I'm now going to ask Aaron to close his eyes. And imagine that he is in his favorite holiday space, having a wonderful time. I don't know whether any of Aaron's friends want to ask him a question, some kind of, or, or ask him to do something whilst we are here measuring his brain waves. Bit of a mean thing to suggest, but anything? No? Lost opportunity there. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, is there anything that you would like to try whilst you've got your brain waves live on stage? Not particularly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> With that, okay. There was a lot of there was a lot of thought there. <laughs> there was a burst of activity and thought. Okay. Thank you so much to Aaron for letting us read your brainwaves live on stage. So this is a very crude. Thank you, Claire. This is a very crude uh, way of looking at brain electrical oscillations. Um, using these electrodes, scientists use um, like kind of caps that contain hundreds of electrodes so that you can look with, with much greater resolution at the brain. And what they've been able to find is that you can use the electrical signatures of the brain to try to help uh, diagnose um, patients' conditions. So, for example, if you've got someone that's had suffered a severe accident and they're in a vegetative state, you can have a look specifically at those alpha waves that I was talking about earlier that are involved in creative thinking and calm thinking. Um, and if you look at those alpha waves, what you can see is you can have a look and uh, determine which of those vegetative state patients are more likely to make a full recovery and regain all of their cognitive capacities and which ones are less likely to. So what you're seeing here on the right-hand side is a patient which unfortunately will be unlikely to regain any uh, behaviors or thoughts. They'll probably never properly wake up, whereas the one on the left-hand side is much closer to the volunteer in the middle, and you can see the electrical oscillations there are very similar. They're, they're kind of represented as a Mohican, a colorful Mohican, but it's showing you how all the different electrical oscillations appear through the brain. Um, scientists are also really interested to see if you can have a look at these EEG readouts, these electrical uh, oscillation readouts, to try and see whether you can predict whether someone has, for example, a propensity to get Alzheimer's or dementia later in life, or even depression or bipolar disorder. And there's been some glimmers of promising results, but the jury is not quite out yet on being able to use this as a biological biomarker for any symptoms that might emerge later on in life. However, there has been an amazing advance in technologies very recently, which means that scientists have been able to image with really high resolution a baby's brain as it develops in the womb. And these are images of uh, a baby that's just 20 weeks post-conception, so just 20 weeks gestation. It's halfway through the pregnancy uh, kind of period. And they're able to image the baby's brain through the amniotic fluid and through the movements and correct for the movements that the babies make. And what they're finding is that some of the 
as they analyze how the neural circuitry, those 86 billion nerve cells, are being laid down within the baby's brain, and as they're following the instructions from the mother and the father's genetics in order to uh, dictate how that neural circuitry is being laid down for the foundations of the baby's brain, they can see that there's some signatures within that baby's brain that seems to indicate so there's some kind of almost like a fingerprint, if you like, but there's some kind of signature which seems to indicate whether the baby is going to, when it does emerge into life, whether it's going to develop symptoms like, for example, autism or depression or even psychosis, schizophrenia, later on in life. So some of these symptoms might not emerge in that baby's life for another 20 years, but they're seeing some biological underpinnings that seem to indicate that these symptoms might emerge later on in life. And perhaps that's not actually that surprising, because at the same time, there's been a genomics rev revolution which allows us to now sequence the DNA within our um, bodies for less, less than $1,000, and it takes less than 30 minutes now, and you're able to sequence the 3.2 billion base pairs that make up a uh, unique blueprint for life. And what those findings, those sequencing findings, are coming, uh, uh, discovering uh, is that there's a lot of genes that seem to uh, be altered that might predispose us to particular behaviors. So there's a high hereditary basis for some very complex cognitive functions, like, for example, how much we weigh our obesity levels. There's a, something in the region of it's thought to be 70% hereditary basis for our actual weight. Even things like our intelligence, there's thought to be a 70 to 80% hereditary basis for that. Things like our socioeconomic status, even how long we might live, our resilience to mental ill health, uh, and a number of different factors, we are increasingly finding that there's a biological basis for this. And if you look at which genes are involved in being implicated in these complex cognitive brain functions, then you're finding that A, it's not one single gene, it's usually hundreds of genes that are converging, and B, these hundreds of genes generally seem to be involved in dictating how that neural circuitry is being laid down in the womb when you're a baby. So it makes sense, really, that we might see anatomical, architectural changes in the neural circuitry in the baby's womb, in the baby when it's in the womb. Okay, well, I'm not, but I'm not trying to suggest by any stretch of the imagination that a baby emerges uh, from the womb and then, you know, that's it. Or, you know, when you arrived onto this world as a baby, that was it. Your fate was completely and utterly set uh, as a basis of the genes from your mum and dad. Obviously, that's not the case. There's an extra layer of complexity to our behavior on top of that. Um, and what scientists have also been discovering is this amazing, amazing phenomenal, uh, phenomena called transgenerational memory and how memories might be passed down across generations. So originally studies have been done in mice. Um, now mice usually love the sweet smell of cherries and cherry blossom. They get really excited by it. Um, and what happens is they pick up the sweet smell of cherries. There's a, uh, a nerve circuit that goes from their olfactory bulb, which sends the electric signal from their olfactory bulb that gets activated by this sweet smell of cherries, and it sends it to the nucleus accumbens, which is this wonderful region that's embedded deep in the middle of the brain called, that's involved in feelings of reward and pleasure and motivation. And it's a region that we are all slaves to, if you like, as well. It's a really uh, important brain region. Now, what the uh, researchers did in America is they wafted in the sweet smell of cherries to where the mice were living. And the mice, predictably, got very excited, scurrying around. They were really motivated. They want to explore their environment to find out where this lovely sweet cherry might be. They're getting quite excited in anticipation of being able to eat it. But then what the scientists did is that they applied a mild electric shock to the mice. So the mice very quickly learnt through association, like Pavlov's dog, to, instead of getting excited by this sweet smell of cherries, they would start tensing up their muscles in anticipation of what would follow, which would be typically an, an electric shock. So very quickly, they learned this new association. 
Then the scientists just let these mice be. They didn't give them any more sweet smells of cherries, and they didn't apply any more electric shocks. And they, these mice wandered around very happily. They had families. The little mice pups also had a wonderful life. No sweet smell of cherries, but thankfully no electric shocks either. And they, little pu those pups had pups, families themselves. So now we're talking about the grandchildren of the original mice. And what the scientists then did is that they started wafting in the sweet smell of cherries. What would happen? Would the mice do what they'd evolutionary been ingrained to do and start getting excited and look for some cherry treats? Or would they do this new behavior that their grandparents had learned and start freezing in anticipation? And what the scientists found is that they did indeed freeze in anticipation. So this new behavior had been learned from the grandparents, from the memories, from the experiences of the grandparents and passed along, even though the pups had not been exposed to this experience before themselves. So what was the mechanism by which this happened? Well, it wasn't any changes in the DNA code, the genes themselves. What it was instead it, is it was a change in the epigenetics, the way that those, that DNA code is kind of packed together, conf, the confirmation of it. So your DNA, like the mice's DNA, is in a double helix with the genes embedded within this beautiful kind of um, spiral staircase almost like structure. And the double helix is also packed down, so it's condensed hugely, and there's lots of loops in it. It's really condensed down so that you can fit all these 3.2 billion base pairs into each one of your cells in your body. So it packs it really, really, really tightly. But the problem is, is that enzymes need to get access to the genes so that they can express them into proteins, so that those genes can operate within your cells. And what was happening in the sperm of the grandfather was that there had been a change in the confirmation, the packing of this DNA, which is called an epigenetic change. And so that affected how the enzymes could get access to which genes, because there had been a change in the way that it was kind of packed together, a change in its shape. And this is how that memory had been passed down along generations, because that change in the shape of the DNA actually instructed genes to act so that the nerve cells from the olfactory bulb, which picked up the sweet smell of cherries, instead of sending a, the nerve tract for the electric signal to go to the nucleus accumbens, the region that's involved in pleasure and reward, instead, that change in expression of genes um, altered that those nerve cell tracks so that they were actually in the baby's brain, the pup um, baby's brain. In, instead, they were being instructed to go to the uh, amygdala, which is another area of the brain that we have as well, which is involved in feelings of fear and disgust. And so the smell of cherries was sending an electric signal to the amygdala in the grandchildren's pups' brains, um, causing them to feel fear and disgust and anticipation of something bad happening and almost a feeling of dread, if you like, so that they would tense up with fear. Now, similar mechanisms seem to exist in humans. And in, in fact, a similar mechanism, another second layer of mechanisms using RNA molecules to affect how DNAs, ex, uh, how the genes are expressed, also seems to exist. There was a study just in the last six months that was published looking at how this uh, occurs, how this memory occurs in worms as well. And these mechanisms seem to exist in humans. The jury is still out exactly as to um, how these mechanisms definitely work, but there does seem to be a growing body of evidence, a growing body of studies that seem to indicate that such transgenerational memories can be passed down um, within other mammals and even worms and possibly humans as well so that our ancestors can provide us with information and memories that affect uh, decisions and the way that react, the way, the way that we behave in life, not based on the DNA that they give us, but the way that that DNA is shaped and conformed. Um, now, I'm also not suggesting that you emerge into this world simply a product of your mum and dad and your grandparents' experiences. It's much more complicated than that. You have the capacity to learn from your own individual unique experiences in life. 
And there's some wonderful studies that are looking at how exactly our brains allow us to learn from our experiences ourselves and how this can affect our behaviors down the line. So, what I did my PhD was on, was on these beautiful structures here, which are basically the tips of the branches, if you like, in those nerve cells, these little structures called dendritic spines that allow those hundred trillions or so of connections to take place within the neural circuitry of your mind, your unique connectome of your brain. And what we're seeing here is a movie, it's 15 minutes that's sped up, of some of the proteins that are involved in... So I've got to... Uh, I'm getting too excited about this. So I've got to take a step back. Okay, so as you learn something new, basically what happens is from one nerve cell, a little wiggly worm called a philopodia-like structure um, kind of reaches out to try and meet the next nerve cell in the circuit. So this is learning. As you try and consolidate that learned thing into a memory, then proteins get recruited, and that little thin philopodia-like structure becomes a, it's called a mushroom-shaped dendritic spine because it looks a little bit like a mushroom. And the way that it um, is shaped like a mushroom is that proteins get re um, recruited, which uh, lie on the surface of that mushroom-shaped dendritic spine that allow the signal from one nerve cell to then pass on to the next nerve cell. And what scientists have done here in this movie uh, is tag some of those proteins that are involved in allowing that learned thing to become a memory um, and tag them with a green fluorescent protein or a, a dye that allows us to visualize these proteins. So what we're seeing here is proteins that are involved in building memories being shuttled across the arborization of the mind. Isn't that beautiful? You're kind of watching memories being formed in the mind. It's just breathtaking to me. So this is really the basis of consciousness, if you like. Consciousness is our ability to form a subjective view of the world, to learn from our experiences. And the way that that happens is that new connections can happen within our, um, can occur within our mind as we learn and remember new things from our environment. And that, allows us to form our subjective view of the world. So if you imagine that each one of you has a very unique set of connections within your mind, a very unique cartography of your mind, a very unique connectome, this neural circuitry with all these connections in your mind, and that's a result of the different genes that your mum and dad uh, gave you and your grandfather's experiences and your grandmother's experiences shaping how those genes are expressed. And then your experiences yourself as well, well throughout your life basically culminate in this connectome, this very individual, unique connectome. So your connectome is very different to the person sat next to you's connectome. And it's that that shapes your perception of the world. There's some experiences that we all share um, that shape our connectome. So, for example, this is a neat illusion that uh, really demonstrates that. We're all used to seeing faces in our environment rather than the back end of a mask. So, our brains make the assumptions. It takes shortcuts in processing because it doesn't want to process everything from the world around us all, the, all its time. Otherwise, it would blow a fuse, really, because there'd just be too much to process. So it takes shortcuts based on what we've learned from previous experiences. Um, and because we're used to seeing faces rather than the back end of the mask, even though the shadows are telling us that it's the back end of the mask, that the eyes and the nose are going backwards in a concave configuration, our brain is ignoring that shadow information and just seeing another face poking out again from the back end of the mask. And this is very similar to what was happening with that gobbledygook sentence and the camel was being kept in the cage at the zoo. So your brain is basically making assumptions all the time based on your prior experiences. And that is a result of the cartography in your mind, that neural circuitry within your mind that dictates how you process information from the outside world, that gives rise to your thoughts and your behaviors. Now, if you imagine that we've each got these common shared experiences, like seeing the front end of the mask, but we've also had these unique experiences throughout our life as well, you can start to imagine how we each build up a very individual perception of the world, a very unique sense of reality based on our past experiences. Is there anything that we can do to strip away at some of these assumptions that our mind builds up 
or maybe some of these bad habits in our behavior that our brain builds up as we proceed through our life. Well, this is something that scientists have been really interested in, uh, and in, in terms of trying to break down any negative associations uh, and looking at ways that we can open up and unlock the potential of our mind. So scientists have been really interested in studying psychedelics, LSD or magic mushrooms, psilocybin, for example, and seeing how that can affect the connectome of the mind and getting rid of these assumptions. So psychedelics are kind of the 60s, 70s famous trippy drug, drug that are involved in uh, kind of helping the person feel a higher sense of consciousness, uh, having a dissolution of ego and feeling at one with nature, and possibly thinking a bit more creatively as well. And there's been a resurgence in the interest in these agents with lots of coders working in Silicon Valley, uh, taking small amounts of LSD, saying that it helps them with their creativity. So scientists put some volunteers in a scanner and watched as they took small amounts of these psychedelics to see what happened. And what they found is that it actually lit up the tree. So on the left-hand side there, you're seeing the brain of somebody who's taking a small amount of LSD. What you're seeing is it lit lights up the whole area, the whole connectome of the brain. So it seems to revert the brain to a much more childlike, naive state that um, strips away at those years of assumptions and short cuts that your brain builds up as you go through your life. Now, I'm not advocating that we all try and uh, kind of open our minds and try and revert our brains to a kind of a fresh slate, if you like, and get rid of any predispositions within our brain by all taking LSD. I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, but there are other ways that we can try to revert our brain to a more childlike, naive state and get rid of those assumptions and to boost our, boost our brain health and that plasticity, that flexibility that allows us to learn things from the environment as well and think more flexibly. And they're general things that um, probably are good for our body as well as our brain. So staying physically active, there's some wonderful studies that have shown that if you exercise, you can boost the number of new nerve cells that are born in the hippocampus, which is a key area that's involved in learning and memory. Um, also, staying socially active and exploring new places, meeting new people, that seems to help those new nerve cells to form functional connections uh, so that they can integrate within that existing neural circuitry of your mind. Checking your diet, anything that's good for your uh, heart is generally speaking really good for your brain because your brain uh, needs huge amounts of oxygen in order for it to pump all those sodium and potassium ions in and out of um, th those neural circuits. Uh, also, getting a good night's sleep helps with, with the consolidation of memory. It helps those mushroom-shaped dendritic spines to form. Keeping on learning helps flexibility. It helps you to um, explore different avenues of thinking and to get rid of bad habits. Um, and staying positive helps with all of these things. Um, there's also some lovely studies that are showing that boosting your alpha waves can help boost creativity and allowing you to think in different ways. So those slow wave um, oscillations within your brain seem to be good. So getting out in nature and doing mild forms of exercise seem to help with your boosting your alpha waves. Um, and also surrounding yourselves with positive influences, so that, that always helps to, um, with your brain health. And there's been a wonderful study there uh, that was recently showing that if you try to get people to engage lots of disparate regions across their neural circuitry, so some people seem to, um, when they're faced with a task, they can think more creatively and come up with a much more creative um, kind of uh, problem-solving technique if they engage all areas across their brain. It might be that some people are predisposed to do this. Is there anything that we can do to try and make our brain uh, work hard and use all areas of the brain? The jury is still out there, I'm not quite sure. Maybe if you think, if you think to yourself, I've got to use all areas of my brain, try and like, recollect like, from my past experiences, is there anything that I could bring in to this, prob this current problem to try and help me solve it? Okay, so, so a lot of the research at the moment seems to be telling us that there's a huge amount of our behaviors which are kind of um, predetermined for us as an individual and that we have this specific cartography of the mind and as we go through life, as we progress through life, then actually there's this reinforcement or this amplification of the neural circuitry that we were already born with. So we're almost going more and more towards the tra trajectory of our life for, for what we were born with within our brain. 
Um, so what does this tell us about free will or agency? Well, I like to think about the fact that we are not the humble sea squirt. So the humble sea squirt is this little, lovely little organism. It kind of wafts around in the ocean current quite happily. Um, and then at some point in its existence, it will find itself next to this rock. And it will think probably to itself, this is a nice rock. I will implant myself on this rock. And so it implants itself on this rock. Now, it doesn't need to move anywhere because the ocean currents will waft past lots of little food, debris, that it can just eat. Now, it doesn't even need to have sex with anyone else because it's hermaphrodite, so it can reproduce by itself. So do you know what this little sea squirt will do? It will just eat its own nervous system at this point because it doesn't need its brain. Now, I would say, or it doesn't need its nervous system, now, I would say that we are the opposite of the sea squirt. We, are, we have evolved to derive great amounts of pleasure from exploring the environment around us and also interacting with other people. We've got this nucleus accumbens, this region that's involved in motivation and pleasure, which is highly wired for us to be social organisms for us to go out and find new things, to discover new things, to come to events like this, for example. And then actually there's these wonderful studies that show us that if we simply discuss our unique sense of reality, a reflection of our unique cartography of the mind with somebody else, then both people will meet it's a more accurate representation of reality than the individual flawed ideas of reality that they actually have, which is wonderful. It's something that we probably already intuitively know. And there were some also some wonderful studies that were done by Benjamin Libet. I'm aware of the fact that I'm totally running out of time now. Uh, that were done in the 1980s, where he basically, uh, the, the experiments have been replicated and refined, and they show that your brain thinks it's made a conscious decision to do something after you think you made the conscious decision to do something after your brain has instructed you to do that. There's this something like a 350 millisecond lag between those two occurrences. And it's thought that maybe this is like a pause button in your brain. So maybe this very small 350 milliseconds uh, window is the opportunity for us to exert some free will. So maybe we need to start to think a little bit more about how we can make the most of that pause button within the mind and not act just as a whim of this beautiful, mesmerizingly beautiful system that operates in our mind of these 86 billion nerve cells and these 100 trillion connections. And with that, I really do have to finish. But thank you very much for your uh, attention over the last five minutes. Thank you.